Dr. Business? Yes, hello, hello. Hello, hello, my name is David Bolton. Yes, David. How are you today? I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. It's a sunny day here in Israel, it's beautiful. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yes. <coughs> How are you, David? I'm good, I'm still uh, waking up on the East Coast. <coughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I understand. Yes, how can I help you? Well, first of all, thank you for taking the call. And secondly, I want to um, say that, again, this is an interview, and so I'm recording the phone conversation. I'd like your okay. permission for that. Okay, you, be, you got it, yes. Good. And then um, if we do anything with this, what we'll do is we'll make a transcript, and I'll send you a copy of it. Okay. Okay? Good. All right. Well, <clears throat> over... I that you will be able to... Uh, understand my terrible Israeli accent. Oh, I can hear you fine. I can understand fine so far anyway. Maybe as we get more technical, we'll have difficulty. Yes. But at the moment, I'm doing great. So thank yes. you. Yes. Um, I am very, very interested to find you. Um, I have been talking to neuroscientists and reading scientists and reading researchers for many years now. Mm -hmm. And I have been particularly interested in understanding the uh, overhead of mm -hmm. disambiguating the code, mm -hmm. meaning by that, that um, from my perspective, as I look at uh, children or adults that are struggling to read, mm -hmm. I see a direct correspondence between the hesitations, starts, stops, and stutters in their articulation, mm -hmm. and the uh, code, the particular area of code that they're dealing with, and the kind of confusion that they're experiencing at that level of the code. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> um, I recently talked with uh, Donna Koch at uh, Dartmouth, and I talked with uh, um, Marianne Wolf yes. at Tufts, and previously I've talked to, you know, Keith Stanovich and uh, Paula Talal and others. Mm -hmm. And what I'm, what I'm really wanting to understand is, mm -hmm the degree to which our, uh, a significant part of our reading difficulties is connected to the processing time it's taking to resolve the letter sound correspondence ambiguities. Yes. And that, yeah, and so that's kind of led me on this, this quest to try to understand that dimension. And most of the uh, neuroscientists don't function in that space. Yes. They don't, they don't, um, we don't have the, they don't have the technology or the mental models to mm -hmm. peer into that window in, in, of confluence and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. interconnection across all of the different modules in the brain that have to feed in um, within certain time windows in order to make everything work. Yes. Okay. So with that kind of as a background, what I'd like to ask from you is, First, to give me a little background on yourself personally and how it is you come to do this kind of work. And then from there, we'll go to some more specific questions about how the uh, virtual reality experience we call reading is constructed. Yeah, I understand. Uh, well, I'm a professor here at the University of Haifa. Uh, currently, the head of the learning, what we call the Learning Disability Department. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a graduate program here in Israel, and um, I am doing research in reading, the reading area for about uh, 25 years by now, 20, 25 years, uh, started for my PhD, and uh, actually I don't know, <laughs> you know I, I, I even didn't think about why and how I came to study reading out of all the things. I think that uh, when I started, I was uh, one of the first in Israel. Uh, we didn't have the setup that you are having or you uh, have in, in America. So I think that I learned in, I, in the United States, I finished my degree there, and, uh, and then I came to Israel. And within the, what we used to call a special education department, and say, uh, Educational psychology. Uh, there was an empty space uh, in the reading, in the area of research in reading, and I started to do it. About um, ten years ago, uh, on one of my uh, sabbaticals in, uh, in New York, I studied electrophysiology and I started to do research uh, 
incorporating also electrophysiological parameters, mm-hmm. mainly because I was studying all the time the issue of time, uh, processing time in information processing and in the reading uh, uh, activity. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how I came actually to uh, study more in-depth speed of processing or that uh, empty space that you called it, uh, processing time, how it affects uh, the reading activity in general and uh, reading disabilities in particular. Uh, that's how, uh, on the personal level. Now, uh, for your second question, Maybe I will give you a very short uh, overview of yes, my please, brief. Yes, please. Please do. And maybe it will uh, lead you to other questions that will follow. Excellent. Um, basically, what we found here many years ago, the dyslexics are very slow. And when I started to uh, study the relationship between what uh, we call the, the various components that activating the reading uh, activity, we found that at least in Hebrew, I don't, at that time, it was only in Hebrew, that uh, there's a causal relationship between uh, reading time, uh, comprehension, and what we call accuracy or decoding the accuracy, was that reading time affect the level of the quality of uh, comprehension and decoding. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, just playing with the data statistically. When you say reading time, you just mean... Simply reading time of reading passages, or uh, I, I'm talking on the, what we, we distinguish now between behavioral measures, which is reaction time, reading time, measured by computer, or by what used to be stopwatch many years ago. Right. Uh, so you're talking about uh, words per minute? Yeah, words per minute, or okay. syllables per minute, or letter per minute, okay. the same thing, words per minute, yes, okay. reading time, on various uh, lengths and complexity of text. Right. So we, we found by analyzing the data with sophisticated measures, statistically measures, like path analysis, what we call, or literal models, that reading rate or reading time affect the level, what we call a independent variable, which affect the level of comprehension and decoding, and not only what we believed until then, that the level of decoding is affect the word per minute. Okay, so there is a also a is there recip- relationship. reciprocal relationships? Exactly, and and what uh, was the new doubt is that it is also comes from the influence of reading time on the accuracy level. Okay, so I started to study this phenomena in depth, and uh, in the laboratory we really manipulated reading rates. Uh, on the various level of uh, dyslexic, uh, from, kin- from uh, first graders all the way to adult uh, dyslexic and non-dyslexics, and uh, measuring the effect of manipulating the presentation time uh, on the level of uh, decoding and comprehension. You mean how long, a, how long a word would appear on the screen? Exactly, okay. or a sentence, exactly. Okay, all right. Now, it was related to each individual time, what we do, and that's a basic manipulation, and I can send you some of my paper that you will be able maybe to understand better. What we do now, we are not just uh, manipulating the reading time arbitrarily, but we measure the basic uh, average time of each individual, word per minute, a sentence per minute, or whatever, and from that on, we are trying to push him to read a little bit faster, meaning to present the sentences on the screen on, in a faster rate. Right, right. So, so you increment up the speed exactly. at which the change is going to, to stretch exactly. their mind into right. performing exactly. faster. Yeah, and okay. what we found something very, very funny, you know, very strange at that time. And it was a repetitive uh, study that we are now, uh, we did it here in Israel, and what we found, and then we did it exact, uh, the same manipulation, we did it in, in America with American kids and, uh, and youngsters and, and students, and uh, now uh, the procedure is uh, rep- replicated in Germany and in France. Now, what we found, that each of us, whether we are good or poor reader, can do better. My, my, uh, basically, the mind or the brain can work better. Yes. What we call in a better shift or a higher shift, like a car. Mm-hmm. And you just have to stretch it a little bit. So even a good reader can do better or can read faster. 
uh, why he is not doing it? Because the brain is lazy. Just lazy, you know, once he solves the solution, he has a solution, he's going, you know, he's going again and again the same route. So the processing infrastructure kind of finds its way into a rut. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that's one thing. The second thing, the dyslexic, now we are coming to the hesitation and, 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 the, and slowness and everything. The dyslexic mind has some additional problems. And one of them is that the template of the, of the word is not stored properly. And every time he has to look for it, he has to connect the graphene to phoneme almost every time that he reads. So he, has, he, he learned to hesitate in order to pu produce it as much as he can in an accurate way. So his brain learned to hesitate in order to allow the synchro mesh to happen Absolutely. between the different components right. that have to feed in. Right, right, that's one thing. Right, exactly. And when you push the brain to wait a little faster, he doesn't have the time to hesitate. So he's, uh, you know, doing whatever he needs to do in order to do it, and he sometimes do it. I mean, most of the time he can do a little bit better. Yes. That's one thing. And I will give you a few uh, evidence from research that we did recently with functional MRI, but let, let me just continue. Okay. Please. Now, uh, later on what we found out that one of the reasons that the brain of the dyslexic don't develop a proper template of the, of the word or the phoneme graphing correspondence is because the reading basically rely on activity of the two roots, of the auditory or auditory phonology and the visual orthography roots, okay? Yes. Now and of course the, inter the integration between the two. Yeah, which is the <clears throat> which is a lot more complex in different orthographies. Absolutely, absolutely, exactly. The, the requirement is very. So, but basically, whether we are talking about Hebrew, Arabic, Semitic languages, or any Roman languages, language. I mean, basically, uh, the, we, you have to see the symbol on the printed material, and you have to make some kind of acoustic. Uh, right. Um, Representation, so it can be in any language, and right. of course but, well, the matching between the visual symbol and the acoustic phonological one is not only rely on the accuracy of the correspondent, but also on the time that those modality are processing the information. Right, so both if, <coughs> mm -hmm. and so at the level that the, <coughs> the the time it takes in a purely phonetic system to to get the association between the visual and the auditory, and then in a, in a non-phonetic uh, where there's a great uh, contextual variation in the sound value that accompanies a letter, exactly. then then there's more processing uh, time it takes to associate those two correctly. Exactly, it's actually a normal cause. Now, yes. if if you have a brain that has some slowness or slow processing speed in one modality compared to the other one, I mean, naturally, one modality we know from from biology, yeah, from neurobiology, is that one in one uh, modality is processing information on a different uh, time scale than the other one. Yes, okay? that we know evidently. What really affect the process is the gap between the processing speed of the two modality. A larger gap, like what we found among the dyslexic readers, yes? Yes. Doesn't affect an appropriate matching between the sound and the, and the visual symbol, okay? Doesn't allow, it, it, it causes mismatch between the two. It goes too slow for the stream to cohere. Exactly, because you know everything has to be fast enough because we are processing information within the limitation of the information processing system. So there is a fading out in the working memory, the place where it has to be matched together because one modality is processed in a faster speed compared to the other one. So what affects actually an appropriate template to be stored is the gap of what we call the asynchrony. That's why I call yes. it an asynchrony. No, it's, it's exactly the right term. I get it completely. <laughs> right. Good. Okay. So what we found that even among adult dyslexic university students, what we call the compensated dyslexics, yes. we found a huge gap between, I mean a larger gap between the 
processing time of the two modalities. And in order to study processing time, I had to learn, you know, this electrophysiology, e.g., potential techniques that will give us an information not like, you know, reaction time at the end of the process, but online information on the perception stage, on the memory stage, and then on the output. Okay? Yes. So that's why we are using in my laboratory electrophysiology parameters in order to study processing time. Now, what we did recently is when we manipulated the presentation time, as I started, you know, telling you about the mm -hmm. acceleration phenomena, we found something very interesting. We manipulated the presentation time according, again, to the individual uh, subject, to the level of the speed of each individual subject, and we uh, put uh, the subject where we study uh, with the aid of functional MRI, and we found that when we push dyslectic to read faster with their own limit of capacity, of course, we saw that the brain, I mean, the activation of the brain become much closer to the one, one of the regular uh, readers. I mean, the brain yes. imaging studies that we did, meaning that the acceleration phenomena within each individual upper limit or limit so you, of, of you capacity. You stretched them out of their pattern, and so they exactly. became more normal. Exactly. So the pattern that we saw in the, in the magnet was very similar, and mainly in the area what we call Broca area. Uh -huh. Broca area. Broca. B-R-O-C-A, okay. Broca. Yeah, Broca. Yeah. Why there? Because when they read at their own self-paced time, or routine time, the broker area is activating immensely, meaning that they are wasting time in order to sound in a silent voice the, the, the sound of the symbols that they are processing. you understand me? Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yes. When we push them to it faster, that's exactly what cut, out, cut off. The processing time in broker area was cut off, and the brain became more similar to a normal brain. So, so it decreased its, it tried to jump over the phonology a bit. Exactly what we called, exactly, short-circuiting the phonological loop. Yes. Now, uh, what I'm telling you was in Hebrew. I mean, the, the last uh, piece of data that I which is more fun, Which is more phonetic and lends itself to this better. Yeah? It is, a, in a way, I know people think that um, um, uh, reading English, you need more to rely on the phonological system because there are many, many irregulars in, uh, in the English script. Right. Whether in Hebrew, do, uh, vowelized Hebrew. Vowelized Hebrew is not complicated, but unvowelized Hebrew is very, very, very complicated. Yes, it's, it has comparable or even greater ambiguities. Exactly, exactly. You have to rely on content. Exactly. So that basically. Uh, did you did you do a comparison between vowel uh, Hebrew and non vowel Hebrew at the same point? That's what we are doing right now. <laughs> exactly, exactly what we are doing right now. Okay, I think exactly. that's gonna that's gonna say something interesting right. about about how much of the processing delay time is associated right. with reconciling this. Right, right. So I know that you know uh, when my colleagues in America and the English speaking countries are very keen and every and the a lot of data that phonology is very, very important. And what they say that basically the dyslectic are impaired in the phonological, uh, in phonological processing, which is true. But what I'm saying that if you know that the <laughs> dyslectic brain is really, uh, have some difficulties, why to give him to process the information on is what we call the ill route, yes. the sick route. Right. To try to somehow so circuiting it. Right, no, completely. But that, that leads to the whole conversation about whole word recognition visually versus yeah. um, learning to sound out words as, a base, as, a, as an early learning to, in the process of beginning readers, learning to sound out words as the mechanism of building up uh, whole word recognition. No, I really think that in general, when you really want to be a professional reader, you must uh, rely on not on the whole world. You have to learn the phonics. I mean, right. there is, I mean, a lot of, uh, I mean, there are quite uh, 
amount of data that showed now that uh, the whole world approach is not actually right. So, 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 so the question is, is, is there a way to get from letters to phonemes without going through the phonological sound out route? No, I, I, I really think that in a way what you do if you speed up one route, mm -hmm. uh, if there was, a, I mean, what we are doing now, we are trying to do some intervention study here now in Israel, again in Hebrew, and we try to find out which route is slower than the other one and what are the gaps between the two processing routes, and we try to speed up one or to delay the other one in order to to bring the brain to match the sound in the symbol. Right? right. So that's what we are doing right now also. In oh, that's excellent. You're, you're right at ground zero, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Let's talk about uh, dyslexia itself for a second. And, okay. and whether or not, I mean, as we just said about the way that people learn early in the process, uh, results in automatic infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when we talk about dyslexic, there's clearly some percentage of the population that has some innate neurobiological variation mm -hmm. that's affecting this. Mm -hmm. But there's also, like in, in, in our country, there's, uh, you know, you know, 80% of uh, African American children, you know, in the fourth grade, are reading poorly. Yes. Huge amount. Now they're they're not neurobiologically dyslexic, yes. but they may have learned in ways that has um, uh, inappropriate has not sufficiently developed the infrastructure to yes. process at the rates and speeds that are necessary for this whole thing to work. Yes. So it's it's an acquired dyslexia yes. based on ha having insufficient oral language capabilities at the time that they encountered the confusions of reading. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Okay. You're right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, let me just uh, <laughs> tell you that the human brain exists about what sixty thousand years as such. As no. such, yeah, d d depending, yeah, depending on whose information you take, 60 to, <laughs> yes. right, as far as the, the language effects, yes. Yes, but no system was devoted uh, along the evolution to reading, nothing. I mean, it right. to, to smell and to, I don't know, but nothing to reading. So basically, I think that the reading activity needed to uh, borrow uh, all kind of systems that were not devoted to the process. Yeah. Now, if you are not uh, developing it like a, like a muscle, a brain is a muscle. If you don't develop it appropriately, you get eighty uh, percent of Afro Americans that uh, cannot read. Or here in Israel, you have the Ethiopians that immigrate to Israel. You know, and also you have the same, we have the same problem with a much shorter extent, but we have the same difficulties. Right. Yeah. Which which I think comes down to fundamentally misperceiving the challenges involved. Yes. But I think that that can be, you know, uh, unlike the compensated or biological dyslexia, that can be uh, what we call fixed or repair or, or remediate or, I mean, that can be done. There is something to do about it. And it can be prevented by understanding better what absolutely. it would be. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, that's where, we're, that's where we meet. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's talk about the timing again for a moment. Yes. I think the work you're doing is just fantastic. It's just I'm delighted and honored to meet you. Thank um, you. Well, uh, you are most welcome. <laughs> if I will come to America, I will let you know. <laughs> yes, good. I'd love to meet yes. you. We could yes. do this on camera. Um, so <clears throat> there's, let, let, let's say that in a – I want to make a distinction about yes. the um, timing associated with working out the ambiguity. Again, as we just as you just said, the human brain didn't evolve to do this. Yeah. What we're talking about is processing an artifact, yeah. a technology. Yeah. The technology has artificially confusing relationships in it. Mm -hmm. They're not natural. They're not the kinds of natural confusions that our somatic proprioceptive systems uh, learn to differentiate and disambiguate and and deal with in nature. Yeah. 
They're they're distinctly different. And whereas um, in the original uh, or early forms of at least the, in the Roman system, they were there was largely a, a phonetic. There was a correspondence between letters and sounds during the times yes. of the Greeks and the Romans yes. and so forth. Yes. Yes. When the, the, this collision happened in the Romance languages, yes. the Roman system was. Um, force fit overlaid onto the sound systems of other languages. Yes. And a, the result was that the uh, reading was no longer code cued speech. Yes. It now required continuous. Vowel I see Hebrew, it's exactly Gothic phoneme correspondence. Exactly, okay, yes. Okay. But, but but I'm talking about now in, in English or any other uh, language Roman. yes, in which the um, the alphabet and the sound system uh, are not phonetic. Okay. Okay. And that the the more complexity um, involved in no, that relationship, mm -hmm. the more brain time potentially necessary to to resolve it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about ultimately, as you're pointing to in your research, that it's all about timing. Yes. Right. Of, of, yes. So so in addition to synchronization. Yes. On ta in time. Yes. Yes. So, so, so the, the 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 synchronization in time. So on the one hand, in order for reading to work, it it must uh, simulate um, language in a way, which has a temporal profile. Yes. Right. And so so the, if it goes too fast or it goes too slow, in a way, it doesn't make sense to us. There's there is a, te a serial temporal profile to language that the reading engine has to simulate. Exactly. Okay. It's tuned to. Yes. But yes. Okay. And so that creates timing parameters. And so the visual recognition and the phonological recognition and assembly and all of that has to happen inside the serial temporal yes. profile window of our language. Absolutely. I mean, basically what we said that we have the systems that are operating on a different time scale and in different brain area. And then you have the language itself. That, that require a, a different way of uh, dealing with it, yes? Yes. Well, that's, that's what comes back to. I mean, if we break it down and we say, uh, you know, how much of the time is, is visual character recognition, that's pretty fast. Yes, yeah? Pretty fast. Yes, All right. yes. And obviously, from a sound processing, when we're talking, the production and the ability to hear phonemes is happening pretty fast, too, uh, in a different circuit. Yes. Okay. But the problem is that uh, you can see a word in one shot when you see it, and you can't hear word in one shot because it has a temporal uh, pattern. Right, right, so right. You have to hold it in your uh, working memory a certain amount of time in, on, on, in order to get the, the meaning of the word. What does it mean? And that has to be fast enough. Exactly. And, and now we're talking about bringing in um, all of the... Uh, pattern variations that associate letters to sounds to words, as well as the uh, context Me. being established by comprehension that has to create the context for uh, variations in the interpretation of letter sounds. Yeah, basically, it's interactive activity between the comprehension and the lower level and the middle level, yes. yes. R right. But, but it, for beginning readers, which are different than good readers, Yes. It, it relies heavily on the ability to produce the interior experience of a word by going through this letter sound assembly. Exactly. Yes. So my, my, my point is, is that a significant percentage of the difficulty that most people face, at least in this country and in, uh, with English, yes. is connected to the time it's taking the brain to work out the letter sound correspondence fast enough to feed the assembly before it stutters. Absolutely right. Absolutely, exactly, yes. And we have some evidence, you know, when you look into the beginner, a brain of beginning, beginner, beginning readers or a brain of dyslectic, you see similar pattern. The brain is searching for the solution. You see a wider uh, area of activation in the brain compared to a, a professional reader, or ro normal reader, or regular reader. Right. Where the information, I mean, the brain is activating at a short period of time in a very local uh, brain areas. 
and not spreading out the activation like a spread activation. And then right. I think that he's not looking for, I mean, you know exactly where to go and how to solve the problem when you will become a more uh, good reader. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> if we were to make a, have you done this, if we were to make a uh, serial temporal map of the um, cycles of processing involved in reading mm -hmm. and looked at the visual input and looked at the phonological assembly and looked at the uh, loop, okay. the, the loop through comprehensional memory. Yes. Um, yes. We would end up with, I think, revealing that the big bottleneck in time is the translation between letter and sound here. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm talking about the lower level, meaning of the perception and processing stage. Yes, you know? yes. But yes, that's critical to get comprehension. It's critical to everything. It's exactly. cons consuming bandwidth. Sure. It's consuming time. Right. Yeah. Exactly. If you don't have a proper template, what can you understand? What, com what, what information can you feed the comprehension system, the frontal lobe? Right. What we call, yeah. But, but, but so, as we know, I mean, some, some letter sounds depends on the word's meaning, which depends on the sentence or context's meaning. So the amount of buffering that has to happen um, in, in time to hold the field of information necessary to disambiguate the correspondences is, 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 is very large here compared to just about anything else humans ever did. Right, exactly, exactly, and, and if you do, and it is very large, and at the same time, the demand of the information processing that in order not to forget or to fade out the information, that the information will not fade out, uh, you have to do it quite fast. Yes. So, I mean, you don't have actually the system, there. the system are in, in somehow processing the information in a slow manner, so what do you do with it? Exactly, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Well, this is wonderful. This is, this is uh, you know, as I talk to neuroscientists, um, so many people are afraid of the, take so much for granted the confusions in the code yes. that they won't look at this dimension. Exactly, exactly. And let me tell you something more even. I think that, uh, you know, there is a, a scientist in America, in, in your country, called Kale, K-A-I-L, Robert Kale. Okay. He's, he's the one that uh, working, uh, doing for many, many years research on the uh, speed of processing. He thinks that uh, it is a characteristic of, of uh, the human brain, meaning that each of us, whether we are a good or poor reader, has a certain speed of processing as a character. And that also contributes to the whole issue of uh, any cognitive process. So not yes. only that uh, we, I have a different probably processing uh, speed than you, and that will affect in a way any cognitive activities that we are doing. On top of it, if one of the modality is impaired in terms of speed or slowness, so that in as an additional uh, cause that affect the entire reading process. Am I clear? Yes, completely. Okay. Um, one of the people that we've interviewed is a, a guy by the name of Todd Risley. Did a yeah. book called uh, Meaningful Differences in the Everyday Experience of Children, uh -huh. where they studied the language exposure across the socioeconomic spectrum of, uh -huh. of children in a very well done, you know, chunk of research. And what they found is that the difference between um, taciturn parents, parents that don't talk very much, and, and upper middle class uh, yakety parents resulted in a, an almost 40 million word exposure difference by age four. And that that difference in word exposure, just language, has a has a, a really strong correspondence to third and fourth grade reading scores, yes. 
Yeah. And has a 78 point per percent correspondence to um, uh, Stanford Binet intelligence test. So that makes perfect sense to me in the sense that the, the, the language environment is the primary exercise environment of the verbal muscle. Yes. And so children that have more complex, high-speed language environments that they're engaging in are being exercised in a way that prepares them for reading later. Yes. Because of processing speed issues, because of phonemic awareness differentiation issues, and because of vocabulary, vocabulary yes. that's radically different yes. than those that are not having that kind of uh, nurturing verbal environment. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, so it, what I'm trying to say is, is that for the most part, you know, um, the variation we see in the performance of, of children coming into reading Mm -hmm. has less to do with their, uh, you know, biophysiological differences and more to do with their learning environment differences. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And also, you know, one of the good hope about the whole issue that uh, we were so focused on the phonological uh, difficulties of uh, learning the code, as you say, mm -hmm. that uh, even the training was always, uh, was, I mean, all the intervention programs were to somehow focused on the phonological training. And uh, that helped somehow to increase phonological processing, but not uh, fluency or, uh, or even accuracy in a way. So, uh, and we know that we can train the brain to do better. And I think that if you, we will focus on training that actually tackle the problem directly, we can do it. Yeah, which is, which is much more like um, doing a deconstruction to feed neuroplastic exercise. Exactly. exactly. Yes? Yes. yes. Um, are you familiar with Keith Rayner's work? On the eye movement? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, are, are you familiar with Paula Talal's fast forward program? In <laughs> It's a very controversial one. Yes, okay, okay. I was, I'm not sure how, what the, like, forgive me if I'm uh, yeah, being naive with yeah. you. I just, yeah. yeah. Not very much. I mean, not very much because, you know, in Hebrew, we have a different uh, difficulty, so I don't Right, know. right, right. No, I'm just thinking that what, we're, what you're describing um, as far as the exercise seems to be um, along the lines of the principal intentions of those two uh, different directions. Uh, Keith Rayner uses uh, narrowing windows and higher speed word presentation. Yes. Um, and fast forward uses variations in uh, increasing the speed of sound recognition, um, both of which are different dimensions of what you're describing, yeah? yeah. I think that uh, what I will add is, uh, I think that if you really would like to train the brain to do better, I I think that what we found, at least in Hebrew again, that when you use context, I mean, we are talking about sentences and not about uh, separate phonemes, uh, you can do better because the uh, reciprocity between uh, um, comprehension and decoding um, help more to induce or this reading speed and the understanding and the reduce uh, uh, decoding error. So meaning that uh, I would have uh, argued that maybe to take, instead of taking phoneme, what uh, fast forward is doing, to take more uh, larger chunks that relate to words and context. Right, I, I totally. So, so in this sense, we're talking about a, um, a something that has some of the principles of whole language, meaning that you want to create uh, meaningful experiences that increase the affect of interest that, and that uh, are comprehensible yes. and, and on the one hand. At the same time, you want to structure that in a way that's, that's calling attention uh, to the um, letter sound patterns in a way that the code can be learned. So they, yes, they both have to function together. Yeah, exactly, but I'm, I'm not talk talking about uh, acquired uh, reading skills. I'm talking about later on training. Yes. The training system, later on, yes. Yes, yes, okay, understood. My primary concern is we've got, uh, you know, 30 or 40 million children in our school systems whose lives are being twisted because they can't learn to do this well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, yes. Now, there's one other piece that I, I wanted to talk about, if you've still got a few more minutes. Yes, yes. 
-hmm. And that is the effect of affect on cognition. And in particular, um, it seems that children uh, or adults who struggle with reading yeah. blame themselves. Mm -hmm. That's the here. yes. They think that they think that the that the confusion that they're experiencing and the difficulty they're experiencing is some reflection of something wrong with them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now. <clears throat> This quickly snowballs over time for people that have difficulty over, you know, over the course of trying to take off in reading into an aversion to reading. I mean, you talk to a lot of people that have had difficulty with this and th they want to avoid it because it, it triggers this feeling about themselves. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's a gross level emotional thing. But at a, at a um, finer level, it seems that the, 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 the moment that somebody goes into self-consciousness about doing this, it robs the, it distracts the brain, distracts and consumes bandwidth and eats up time. Mm -hmm. So that in addition to the purely code language level processing, there's an emotional component on the one side, creating the uh, interest that powers the attention, mm -hmm. and on the other side, mm -hmm. it, as soon as it goes negative, mm -hmm. it will bust up and stutter up the processing ecology. Mm -hmm. And that that is a cognitive problem in the sense that it's, it's fundamentally affecting the cognitive processing ecology and efficiency. Exactly. I think that the only way to deal uh, with it is if there is a way to identify uh, any cognitive or reading difficulties as early as possible and to prevent all kind of uh, emotional difficulties and reciprocity between the two. Yes. Well, my question is, do you know anybody uh, or have you yourself tried to, to use your equipment to detect um, the affect triggering? Uh, into negative affect and see its, its, its effect, its turbulation on cognition in the task of reading? Uh, not that I know of. Not of it, no. no. Well, given, given the time precarious nature of all of this, yeah. this seems like it's a critical, important right. component to understanding uh, reading even yeah. at the, mm -hmm. this deep level. Yes, exactly. I'm sure that there is a reciprocity between the two, between the affect level and the cogn cognitive difficulties, definitely. You know, like uh, we know it from the hyperactive phenomena, which is causing the effect of uh, uh, the comorbidity of uh, hyperactivity and reading difficulties. Right. Which one affects what? Yeah, it's the same thing. So, yes, yes, I know, I know. I, the same. I think that there is somebody who is in who is doing uh, research on the uh, affect um, effect of on learning disability in general. She's a lady from uh, Toronto, University of Toronto. Her name is Judy Winner, but she's not doing any brain uh, research, only behavioral. Ju Judy, what was her last name? Winner, Winner, W-I-N-N-E-R. W-I-N-N-E-R. Yeah, Wiener, Professor Judy Wiener is the special education department uh, in faculty in the uh, University of Toronto. Excellent, good. I happen to be going to Toronto in a couple weeks, so. Yeah. 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 Well, I think it's really important um, to br to bring neuroscience to bear on the role of affect yeah. in. Um, both powering and disempowering and turbulating cognitive tasks here at this level. Yeah, I'm sure that you're right. Yes, yes, yes. And you're definitely right. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So is there anything it's else? Complica complicated to measure it a bit, you know. When you want to, to study reading, you put symbols on the screen. 
and affect it's a bit complicated. Yes, but but you know what? I, I think there are there's people out there that are that are doing work. Um, that can um, show different dimensions of affect from fa facial display signatures, yeah, the facial, the facial, yeah. right? And so that it's possible to correlate, to take facial display information, other um, uh, biometrics, and superimpose them over data that's being gathered through systems like you're using to show their correlated effect. Okay. Yeah, it can be a good idea. Yes, yes. Yes, it can be a good idea. Yes, yes. Good. Well, what is, is there anything else that um, that you think would uh, be important for our conversation here before we close? Um, not that I can think about it right now, but maybe later when I read the transcript, I will be able to add something. <laughs> okay. At any time. Um, if you encounter something or uh, come up with something that you think would, would benefit, if you'd send me an email, I'd get right back on the phone with you. Good. And if you come to America, I'd love to meet with you and take you to dinner and talk some more. Good. And are, do a, you in, are you in New York or where, where are you? Where at the moment, I'm in Kentucky. But I'm on, I travel a lot. We travel around the country um, filming and uh, conducting interviews and making this uh, documentary so that we can try to make all of this uh, science commonsensical to parents and teachers. Uh -huh. I see. I see. Good. So uh, if I will come to America, I will let you know, and uh, you have an open invitation to come to us. Oh, thank you. If, if something else comes up and I want to talk more, can I email you and request another? Sure, sure, sure. sure. Okay. So sure, with pleasure. Okay, a great pleasure to talk with you, ma'am. The same here. All right. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.